Hello, I'm Philippa Lamb and welcome back to the Pension Confident Podcast. This time we're going to be talking about financial inclusion because more than 7 million people are financially excluded in the UK alone. So what does that mean and what needs to happen to make sure financial services work well for all of us? We've heard a lot of talk from politicians lately about levelling up. Now, put simply, that is all about creating opportunities for everyone wherever they live and making sure that no one falls behind. But when it comes to financial services, falling behind isn't always about where you live. Sometimes it's a system or a service that just is not set up to work well for you. Things like payments, savings, credit or insurance. Why isn't it working for you? Well, that might be down to your ethnicity, your sex, religion, gender or your age. It could even be about your relationship situation or your health status. Lots of factors can play a part and exclusion can have very serious consequences. So what can be done about it? If you grow up in a less wealthy household, credit can be seen and was definitely seen in my family as a very bad thing. Yeah. The world has, has moved online and that brings its own particular challenges. Now the world is internet and apps and if you're visually impaired that's a considerable barrier. When I talk about immigrant communities there's this certain reluctance to trust financial institutions. It's due to the fact that they have been discriminated against in some shape or form in the past. Helping us level up financial services today, we have three guests. Nina Mahanti is the CEO of Bloom Money, which is a community saving platform that helps people move into the UK from other countries to save for their future. Hi, Nina. Hello. So glad to be here. Emma Barrow is Head of Communications at the Financial Services Compensation Scheme, or FSCS. Hi, Emma. Hello. Thank you for having me. And as always, our third guest is one of Pension B's own experts, this time Chief Design Officer Matt Loft. Hi, Matt. Hello. Because we're talking about money and finance, here is the usual disclaimer before we start. Please remember that anything discussed on this podcast should not be regarded as financial advice. And when investing, your capital is at risk. What we often find in immigrant communities in the UK is people prefer to use cash Mm -hmm. and they prefer to have it with them. So, you know, we refer to this mysterious box under the mattress and granny has all of her cash just sat there, right? And people kind of go, oh, that's, you know, from, that's ages ago now and people don't do that anymore. But we still find that people do that. And there's this certain reluctance to trust financial institutions. And I think when I talk about immigrant communities, oftentimes people of colour, it's due to the fact that they have been discriminated against in some shape or form in the past. So, you know, I've spoken to people who have gone in for a loan, they've been rejected. And because of that, there's this feeling of shame and they go, right, well, I don't want to interact with the bank ever again. They just decide to live in cash-based economies that aren't part of our formal economy here. Sadly, they face similar challenges to other industries. The world has has moved online and that brings its own particular challenges. It's important, I think, to recognise it actually provides huge opportunity for those people. But the way technology moves is, is quite interesting to think about. It used to be that you physically went to your bank branch, for instance, to deposit your cheque or or conduct whatever you needed to. We moved through telephones and that that became a primary way of doing things. If you've got to go to a building, that's a mobility issue. If you you physically find it hard to get there, if you're doing something over the phone and you're hard of hearing, that's a problem. Now the world is internet and apps. And if you're visually impaired, that's a considerable barrier. So a lot of the work we're doing at Pensionby is around trying to utilise the latest technology to help those people by and large, having apps and the internet is fantastic. Like if you do have yeah, mobility issues, for instance, suddenly the world's opened up to you because you have so much power in the palm of your hand. It really is dependent on, on your particular disability and your particular situation. I've got an aunt and she's 90 now. And sadly, she lost her two siblings last year. So she's now left to look after everything. She's never had children. And as you say about moving online, she's never had the, just never had the internet. Never had a mobile phone, not at all. And all her branches have shut. But then she's stuck in this interesting kind of quandary where she would happily transact over the phone. But how do you find the phone number? Oh, yeah. How do you find the phone number when you can't go to a branch? You haven't got an app. You haven't got the internet. Wow. You haven't got a debit card. She's never had a debit card. She's never been interested in that. She's always worked dirt in cash. Wow. She literally cannot find that phone number on her own. So she has to get someone else to do that for her because there's physically no way. They're not in the paper. They're not 
they're online and she's found it really difficult to especially with the her two siblings dying and there's been a lot of like paperwork and things to sort out finding phone numbers is almost impossible without the internet it's a very complicated subject one that we really are just sort of trying to get to grips with now we okay. do a lot of research general consumer research on a, a range of topics and it's to help us inform how we communicate our protection and we talked about advice, pensions, investments, all sorts of things. And there's always a disparity between men and women in every single thing we've done, just in terms of their attitude. So like Matt says, it's a really complicated problem. Their whole fundamental beliefs around finance are very different. And we see things like women are more likely to speak to a friend or a family member about something rather than do something different. Or women are more likely to consult almost ad infinitum until they make a decision on something, whereas men are really gung-ho and will just go and open that pension or make that investment. So it's re there's, there's some really knotty issues in there. There are everyday people who are credit invisible because they perhaps have never tried to get credit. Mm. Well, so yeah. Even I mean, young, young people, you know, yeah. you leave home, you're credit invisible, aren't you? Exactly. And again, culturally, if you grow up in a less wealthy household, credit can be seen and was definitely seen in my family as a very bad thing. Yeah. Mm. You didn't borrow money, yeah. you saved and you, you lived within your means. Whereas I think wealthier people are because they're more confident in being able to pay back the credit, credit mm -hmm. becomes something that you access earlier. Like, you see it all over TikTok and stuff, and it is true. Like, you get teenagers with credit cards. I'm not saying they understand it better, but they have an exposure to it at a much younger age. Mm -hmm. So when I went to university, I remember being terrified of getting a credit card because it was drummed into me that that's, mm -hmm. you do not borrow that's money it. because yeah. it's scary and you mm -hmm. might not be able to pay it back and then bad things happen. <laughs> The number of people who are you know, at risk or have terrible credit scores, can't get a mortgage because they have gambling transactions in their bank accounts, and they find it really difficult to come back from that. Well, someone, I assume, at Monzo had experience, lived experience of being in that at Monzo Bank and built a feature where you could actually block gambling transactions. And that that's now become ubiquitous across you know, the banks in the UK. I think oftentimes about same-sex couples and trying to get a loan for surrogacy or adoption, right? And we often don't think about these things if we're not of that community. If we had more same-sex couples working in banks who understood that actually it's really hard to fund something when the NHS isn't covering it and we just want to have a child, how are we going to build that product for them? So I'm, I'm very, very bullish on this idea of a more diverse workforce that can build better outcomes for everyone else. Thank you.